Friendship is an amazing thing. It builds us up and nourishes our souls. It causes relationships to happen that just blossom and deepen as friendships develop. It was about a year and a half ago that I thought I would reach out to an old childhood friend. He's old by now because he was my childhood friend. Um, the, the internet's an amazing, wonderful thing. I, I scurried and queried his name in every possible configuration. I found his mother, his brother, his sister, but he was hiding out there somewhere yet to be found. Finally, last Christmas, he popped up in a PDF in, uh, in a job file where he was working. I sent him an email and said, I'll be back in Minneapolis, how about getting together for lunch? We haven't quite connected, but friendships are kind of like that, aren't they? You can, be, you can be apart for a while, and when you come back, you kind of sort of pick up where you left off. And it sometimes seems like just yesterday, or maybe a decade or two, or several decades, as the case may be. It's interesting that Jesus calls us his friends. And that nourishes our souls, doesn't it? It draws us into a relationship with him. As we've been looking at our series on family, just setting the context here, we talked about our Heavenly Father and his family and realized that we collectively have been a prodigal family. And while we were all prodigal going our own ways, he sent his only begotten son and he chased after us rather than we seeking him. And then we looked at uh, we looked at his love as being proactive. Then we looked at our church family as a whole being part of his fa excuse me being part of his family. And we looked at our immediate families in uh, loving God. We looked at our children being part of the family that they are currently the future and the present church all rolled into one. Because unless, unless they are incorporated into the church, unless they believe in Christ, the mission and purpose of the church will not continue. The future of the church and the present of the church all into one. So we're expanding family a little bit and we're looking at friends of the family. Every family has friends, don't you? Some are, some are just very lovable. You love to see them coming. Some of them are friends of mom or dad. They're a little quirky. Some of them are friends of the teenagers that mom and dad would prefer. Maybe you'd see them someplace else. <laughs> Extended friends of the family. Different uh, different friends bring different things to us. But friendship nourishes our souls. We can't live alone and thrive. And it's through healthy friendships that we develop in ways that we could never develop by ourselves. So we're going to look at several facets of friendship uh, this morning. It was Aristotle the happiness philosopher who wrote at length about friendship. He was the first person to distinguish between different types of friendship. He described friendships for mutual utility and friendships for mutual benefit. 
uh, the four types of friendships that he qua uh, qualified were identified as acquaintances, casual, uh, uh, agetic, and true. The, uh, the acquaintance friendships, just to set a little bit of background, and you can plug in where your friendships might fall with others and where they might fall with you. The acquaintance friendships are friendships like one might have on Facebook. You've seen those Facebook pages that have 214 friends. And you've seen those Facebook pages that have 1,318 friends, as if to suggest that somehow the, uh, the page holder for that page would be in constant contact with 1,200 people. Please tell me it ain't so. Yeah, they sign up, I'd like to be your friend. Click, you're my friend. I'll hear from you and communicate with you when you post something on my Facebook. Casual acquaintances or acquaintances at a bit of a distance. The second class or the second group would be casual acquaintances. People that you get together with occasionally. It might be, um, it might be for lunch, it might be a soccer game, somebody you meet in a bowling league, somebody that you sit across from uh, at church potluck. It's casual acquaintances. The agetic uh, friendships are those that are more pragmatic. Uh, those friendships that might uh, be around purpose. Maybe you're part of a sailing club. Maybe you're part of, um, part of a club, uh, uh, Habitat for Humanity. Take part in those types of programs. Maybe you're helping with Vacation Bible School and it's your mission and purpose to set an example for the kids and bring them to the Lord. It's a purpose-driven type of friendship. And then there's a deeper friendship type that he suggests, and that's a true friendship. The, the friendship that goes beyond just the casualness, just the purpose-driven friendships to the deep, meaningful ways of sharing concerns in life, of sharing needs in life, of sharing heartfelt expressions of love and gratitude, of building up, of sharing observations appropriately so. Have you considered what you're doing from this vantage point? Because it's as we share that we grow. And as we grow and nurture each other, it's as we mature in the Lord. So, let me ask you, how many true deep friendships do you have today? Would you like more? I certainly would. How about you? You might feel you have one or two, or you might feel you have all you need. But friendships are God's gift to us because rich friendships enrich, deep friendships enrich our lives. So much so that the Mayo Clinic staff did some studies and uh, they illustrated the fact of how beneficial healthy friendships are. Good friends are good for your health. Friends can help you celebrate good times, provide support during bad times. Friends prevent loneliness and give you a chance to offer needed companionship too. Friends can also increase a sense of belonging, a sense of purpose. They can boost your happiness and reduce your stress. They can improve, excuse me, they can improve self-confidence and self-worth. They can help you cope with the traumas of life, such as serious illness, job loss, divorce, separation, death of a loved one. They can encourage you to change or, in, or avoid unhealthy habits, excessive drinking, lack of exercise. And in fact, maintaining friendships takes effort. And studies show that if you don't have deep friendships in your life, the isolation, the isolation from that often leads to depression and breaks down your resistance and takes a toll 
that is similar to smoking or drinking on the impacts that it has on a person's health. Did you catch that? If you want to be robust and have a robust life spiritually and feel well, develop, develop deep, meaningful, and many friendships. The quality of friendships is as important as the quantity. It's never too late to build new friendships, to connect with old friends. Investing time in making friends and strengthening friendships can pay off in better health and brighten your outlook for years to come. I don't know how it is in your life, though, friends. I know how it is in mine. We live in a very busy time. You drive to the airport, and if you get on, if you get on the 405 at the wrong time of day, you can see as far as the eye can see. Ten lanes of traffic, five going in one direction, five going in the other. And if you count the cars, you probably have as many cars as you can see as some towns have in their entire population. At night, it's an amazing sight to see all those ants going home with their headlights on. It's an amazing sight to behold as you're stuck in the middle, isn't it? It's an amazing thing to pull into your driveway and to hit the remote control on your garage door and the garage door goes up and you drive into your garage. You hit the down button and the garage door goes down. And you're finally home at 9.30 at night to wake up at 4 so you can beat the what? Traffic and get to work on time. And it's the same 25,000 cars on the 405 that you saw on the way home. And we're in the midst of all of these people. So close and yet so distant. Do you ever feel that way? We know, we know there's two people in the house four doors down from us because we've seen them in the last four years. We think the ones across the street are still living there, but we're not quite sure. How is it in making friends with those that are close by? and connecting those friends to Jesus, our friend. For you see, 90% of the people that give their hearts to the Lord Jesus Christ do so as a result of an invitation from another friend to come to an evangelistic meeting, to come to church, to come to a Bible study in a home. Friendship first. Showing Christ's love in a tangible way, building those relationships, introducing them to Jesus, your best friend. The story is told by a Christian I reflected over the years as what it means to love your neighbor. When I lived in rural America outside of Portland, Oregon, she writes, this seemed like an easier feat. Our nearest neighbor lived a few hundred yards away, and I'd have to walk a mile in any direction to find someone we didn't know. And then I moved to New York City, and my neighbor became someone I didn't know. My city, my neighbor, my block are filled with people who don't know me, don't care to know me, don't, like, don't look like me, don't talk like me, don't smell like me, don't think like me, and have no desire to change that fact. This is true to the extent that I haven't yet caught the names of a couple who were subletting the apartment next to ours. In short, I literally don't know my literal neighbors. I find that it's pretty hard to love people that I don't know. And sometimes we all, myself included, use that as an excuse to not even try. 
One day, Brendan, Brendan, a young rising DJ in New York, was coming home to his Brooklyn apartment when a homeless woman asked him for money. By the end of the week, she asked him two more times. Each time he said no. Finally, out of, out of desperation, she replied, he said, no, I don't have any. Finally, she spoke frankly and said, you better not because every day you say no. Inserting some rational thinking into another awkward, wise conversation, he proposed, I'm on my way to get a job. I'm going to an interview. And if I get the job, I promise I'll take you out for Chinese food. This promise yielded a friendship that neither were prepared for. That changed the trajectory of both of their lives, both forwards and towards each other. Brendan got the job, but their friendship didn't just didn't stop with Chinese food. They built a friendship based on mutual support, spending their birthdays, their holidays, and tough times together over a period of eight years. The homeless woman and the DJ. Opposite ends of the spectrum to start with, until they took time and got to know each other. When Brendan Cedar broke, eight year over a period of eight years later, when Brendan Cedar broke, she made him a blanket. Two days later, when he told her that he lost his job, she disappeared, returning minutes later, bringing him groceries, which continued throughout the winter months, even with so little. She never hesitated to give back. Over the years, Jackie moved from the streets to the subway stations, into a halfway house, YMCA, and is now moving into an apartment. To celebrate that particular move, Brendan wanted to do something special for Jackie. So he took her down to Target, and she started a registry of the things that she needed to move in as she, uh, as she moved to her apartment. He started a GoFundMe page, was hoping to raise $500. $6,000 came in to the account. And they're going to use the extra funding to support other women in need. Amen. Just stopping for a moment. Just acknowledging another person, being a stakeholder in your community, looking somebody in the eyes and not looking through them, not looking beyond them, not dismissing them, and listening to their story. Next door, down the block, a half mile away, the people on the job, they're all looking for friendship. Do you see it in their eyes? Do you see it in their quietness? Do you see it in their tears at times? Friendships, quality friendships, reaching out to others bringing them the love of Jesus in a tangible way. Oh, I believe God is looking, looking for a people who would develop just seven simple things that will foster friendship. It really isn't complicated. It's a listening ear that will listen. It's a gentle touch that will reach out. It's a kind word in due season. It's a word of encouragement. It's a smile. It's a soft answer. It's an open heart to connect with another person. Looking for friends, looking to deepen a loving relationship with them so that they might be blessed, so that you might be blessed as well. 
being the tangible face of our Lord Jesus Christ, to those who are lonely, to those who are wandering, friends of the family of God, they're all over, aren't they? Some of them are real quirky, aren't they? Some of them are real strange, aren't they? And some of them you don't know, and God's waiting for you to get to know them, isn't he? They are amazing people. And if we'll take the time and just reach out in very kind, careful ways, you will find friendships that you will be glad in the days and weeks ahead that you develop. The family of God is large, but God wants his family larger. So how does it happen? We have, we have our nuclear families, our biological families, but God's family has friends. And he wants it to grow, and he wants it to expand exponentially. What would happen if we each made seven new friends this year? Do you, do you think a few of them? would actually join in your spiritual journey? I can't imagine that. That would not happen. I just believe it would happen, friends. But the first step, the first step is to reach out and just smile and be friendly to them. And give them a loving, uh, a loving smile and a kind word. Sometimes through the years, though, you go looking for lost friends, and you find them. And it ends in a very happy way. As you reflect on your ability to build friendships, as you reflect on the current friends you have, on the friends that you know casually that you like to deepen, I'd like to suggest you reflect on the old friends that you haven't kept in touch with. You remember them, don't you? The ones you graduated with, the ones you went to grade school with, the ones that you knew before you moved two times ago, and you sent Christmas letters for a while, and you'd return one if you got one, and pretty soon you dropped all but four, and it's email now instead of regular mail, and we click the email, and we're glad to find out what's going on in their life. Reaching back can be very rewarding as old friends meet. Stories told, the author's name is not known, but he writes, As I walked home one freezing day, I stumbled on a wallet someone had lost in the street. I picked it up and looked inside to find some identification so I could call the owner. But the wallet contained only three dollars and a crumpled up letter that looked like it had been in there for years. It appeared to be obviously a man's wallet for it had red lacing around the outside. The envelope was worn and torn, and the only thing that was legible was the return address. I started to open the letter, hoping to find some clue. Then I saw the date line, which was over, at that time, over 60 years old. The letter had been written six decades before. It was written in beautiful feminine handwriting on powdery blue stationary, with a little flower in the left-hand corner. It was a Dear John letter that told the recipient, whose name appeared to be Michael, that the writer could not see him anymore because her mother forbade it. Even so, she wrote that she would always love him. It was signed, Hannah. It was a beautiful letter. There was no way except for the name Michael that the owner could be identified. Maybe if I called information the operator could find a listing off the address and I could at least 
track down Hannah. Operator, I begin. This is an unusual request. I'm trying to find the owner of a wallet that I found, and there's no other information but this address. Can you tell me who, the, who lived at this address and give me their phone number? The operator appropriately so, said, I cannot, but let me give you to my supervisor. The supervisor said, I'm sorry, we cannot give out that information, but I will connect you to that number if you would like to wait, which she did. A few minutes later, she was back on the line. I have the party who will speak with you now. I asked the woman on the other end of the line if she knew anyone by the name of Hannah. She gasped. We bought a house from a family who had a daughter named Hannah, but that was 30 years ago. Would you know where the family could be located now, I asked. I remembered that Hannah had to place her mother in a nursing home some years ago. Maybe if you got in touch, they might be able to track down her daughter. She gave me the number of the nursing home. They told me, the elderly lady had passed, passed away years ago, and they did have a number for where they thought the daughter might be living. I thanked them and phoned. The woman who answered the phone explained that Hannah herself was now living in a nursing home. This whole thing was stupid. I thought to myself, why was I making such a big deal over finding the owner of a wallet that only had three dollars in it and a letter that was almost 60 years old? Nevertheless, I called the nursing home in which Hannah was supposed to be living and the man who answered the phone said, yes, Hannah is staying with us. Even though it was already 10 p.m., I asked if I could come by to see her. Well, he said hesitantly, if you want to take a chance, she might be in the day room watching television. I thanked him and drove over to the nursing home. The night nurse answered the door and a guy and greeted me and took me to the day room. We went up to the third floor and the nurse introduced me to Hannah. She was a sweet, silver-haired, old-timer with a warm smile in a twinkle in her eye. I told her about finding the wallet and showed her the letter. The second she saw the powder blue envelope with that little flower in the upper left, she took a deep breath and said, young man, this letter was the last contact I ever had with Michael. She looked away for a moment, deep in thought, then said softly, I loved him very much, but I was only 16 at the time, and my mother felt I was too young. Oh, he was so handsome. He looked like Sean Connor." The actor, yes, she continued, Michael Goldstein was a wonderful person. If you should happen to find him, she hesitated, almost biting her lip, tell him I still love him. You know, she said, smiling as tears begin welling up in her eyes. I never did marry. I guess no one ever matched up to Michael. I thanked Hannah and said goodbye. I took the elevator to the first floor, and as I stood by the door, the guard there asked, Was the old lady able to help you? I told him she had given me a lead. At least I have a name, but I think I'll let it go for now. I spent almost the whole day trying to find the owner of this wallet. He was holding it in his hand. 
The guard looked at the wallet, which was a simple brown leather case, wrapped a uh, brown case with wrapped red lacing around it. The guard saw it and said, hey, wait a minute. That's Mr. Goldstein's wallet. I know it anywhere. That bright red lacing. He's always losing that wallet. I must have found it in the halls at least three different times. Who's Mr. Goldstein? I asked as my hand began to shake. He's one of the old timers on the eighth floor. That's Michael Goldstein's wallet for sure. He must have lost it on one of his walks. I thanked the guard and quickly ran back to the nurse's office. I told her what the guard had said. We went back to the elevator and got on. I prayed that Mr. Goldstein would be up. On the eighth floor, the floor nurse said, I think he's still in the day room. He likes to read at night. He's a darling old man. We went to the only room that had any lights on, and there was a man reading a book. The nurse went over to him and asked if he had lost his wallet. Mr. Goldstein looked up with surprise, put his hand out, uh, checking his back pocket, and said, Oh, it's missing again. This kind gentleman found your wallet and wondered if it might be yours. I handed it to Mr. Goldstein, the wallet, and the second he saw it, he smiled with relief. Yes, it's mine. It must have dropped out of my pocket this afternoon. I wanted to give you a reward. No, thank you, I said, but I have to tell you something. I read the letter in the hope of finding who owned the wallet. The smile on his face suddenly disappeared. You read the letter? Not only did I read the letter, I think I know where Hannah is. He suddenly grew pale. Hannah, you know where she is? How she is? Is she still as pretty as she was? Please, please, tell me, he begged. She's fine. Just as pretty as when you knew her, I said ever so softly. The old man smiled with anticipation and asked, Could you tell me where she is? I want to call her tomorrow. He grabbed my hand and said, you know something, mister? I was so in love with that girl that when that letter came, my life literally ended. I never married. Guess I always loved her. Mr. Goldstein, I said, come with me. We took the elevator down to the third floor, the hallways were darkened, and only one or two nightlights were on, lit our way to the day room where Hannah was, sitting alone watching television. The nurse walked over to her. Hannah, she said gently, pointing to Michael, who was waiting with me in the doorway. Do you know this man? She adjusted her glasses, looked for a moment, but didn't say a word. Michael said softly, almost in a whisper, Anna, it's Michael. Do you remember me? She gasped. I don't believe it. Michael, it's you, my Michael. He walked slowly towards her and they embraced. The nurse and I left with tears streaming down our faces. See, I said, See how God is good? The good Lord works. If it's meant to be, it will be. About three weeks later, I got a call at my office from the nursing home. 
Can you break away on Sunday to attend a wedding? <laughs> Michael and Hannah are going to tie the knot. It was a beautiful wedding with all of the people in the nursing home dressed up, joining in celebration. Hannah wore a light beige dress and looked beautiful. Michael wore a dark blue suit and stood there tall. They made me the best man. The, ho uh, the hospital gave them their own room. And if, if you ever wanted to see a 76-year-old bride and 79-year-old groom acting like two teenagers, you had to see this couple. A perfect ending to a love affair that had lasted nearly 60 years. How is it, friends? You have friends. You have friends that are your current friends. I would challenge you this week to do three things. To make a new friend. Reach out to somebody to make a new friend. To deepen and strengthen a relationship with a current friend. To reach back to an old friend to connect with them. And then to draw all of your friends to your greatest friend, that they might become friends with our Lord Jesus Christ, our greatest friend.